right, welcome back to Watchbox Studios and Watches Tonight. I am your host, Tim Masso. This evening, we discuss the Rolex Tourbillon you always wanted, showcase the best of Omega Seamaster, restore the honor of Roger Dubuis, the brand, Plus, I'm sharing your viewer wrist shots. I asked, you answered. It's all here tonight on Watches Tonight. First, remember who puts these lights over my head? It's the watchbox.com, a redesigned website and the best watches in the business. Vintage, late model pre-owned, independence, group brands. You have your choice. You're gonna find the style you like in the size you like. So open a new window, keep me streaming, and check out the new thewatchbox.com. All right. I should also remind you, timmasso.com, all one word, is where you can continue the journey after the show ends with my podcasts and my articles. We are updating constantly, and it's another place alongside my Facebook group, Talking Time with Tim Masso, where you can interact with me more or less continuously when I'm not on the air on Mondays. This, by the way, is the official after party to watch us tonight, Talking Time with Tim Masso. I can see we've got friends in the box joining in, Blue Shirt Buddha, Eddie Landsberg, Edward Ledden of Sweden, Mr. No Date, Alex Alex O, Get Outta, Nolan Reed from Atlanta, Marco Bernardi joining in. We've got Matteo C joining in with John N, Hale Bop, Simon Holt, Marco B. And of course, we've got Miroslav R joining in from Belgrade in continental Europe, Dr. Stu, Alan L, Daniel Waxman, Terry C, Marceau R from New Orleans, from New Orleans. And we've got Jabo Surf from Adelaide, Australia, Pratham K from Toronto, Canada. We've got Miguel S from San Juan, Puerto Rico, Galvin Wong, Global Watch Mames, Alexi Samola of Finland, and MCC Le Chinois, Fordson 999, Charlie Z, and Raphael S joining in from Puerto Rico. Oh, all right, guys. Sounding off in the box. Now let's do it on screen. Viewer wrist shots number one. I asked you answered. Let's see what you got. Saad A from Saudi Arabia starts us with the roar of an Audi V8 4.2 in Saudi Arabia. He joins it with his H Moser and C. Pioneer Santer seconds in green. That is probably my favorite shot of the day. I got to admit. <laughs> Watches and wheels. I'm a sucker. Jay from LA stuns with his Kodoka 2 and Kona's finest morning grind. Setting a high standard here, guys. Henry E. and Leo the Chihuahua chill with the fabulous Patek Philippe 5172G chronograph. Loving those lugs. And the puppy, Simon H. and his VC overseas, rose gold, blue dial, are ready for the pandemic to be over with some travel planned. And we've got Jake C. of England out in the Midlands celebrating the birth of his son with a 2020 Rolex Submariner. Very cool. I assume that will one day be the young man's. And because you've asked... And before we move on to other brands, we have the obligatory Rolex content. You asked me about things Rolex will never do, and I'm going to explain why Rolex will never do them. I mentioned a, 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 a tourbillon watch, perhaps a Datejust tourbillon, a Date 8 tourbillon. Here's why it's not going to happen. And let's start with the first thing Rolex will never, ever do. First, retro watches. And by this, I mean out-and-out -out vintage style caliper style tribute re-editions. Not vintage inflected, but full blown retro. Think PT Cruiser for your wrist. So although the 2021 Rolex Submariner is recognizable as an evolved 1953 Rolex 6204, that was the first sub back in 53, it's not a retro watch. Uh, the sub is an evergreen design. It's not like the 911. Again, never out of production. The key is unbroken production. There has never been a gap year or a gap decade. It's not like the Milgauss where it disappeared for two decades. The sub has changed little by little, generation by generation and model by model. So it's evolved. It's never been revived from the dead as a throwback. Now if you want to see a watch that is exactly that, revived from the dead from a different era, the Tudor Heritage Black Bay that we discussed last week, this is a tribute to 1950s Tudor and Rolex Submariners. This represents a lot of design language that was phased out decades ago, like the chaptering, like the gilt style printing, like the big crown, like the no crown guard case. All of that represents the past, and that's what Tudor does within the Rolex empire. It serves as the retro tech, retro spec, retro look modern day watch. So, Another thing that you will never see Rolex do, and once again, Tudor's kind of picking up the slack here, you will never see Rolex do a titanium, ceramic, or sapphire watch. Right there is the old chronograph Titan 
IWC Porsche Design 3700. It's a great example of a titanium watch, so I used it. Rolex uses titanium on only one watch, and only one part of one watch. If you look on the case back of the Deep Sea, either the James Cameron or Standard, you will find that the ring lock system, which is like a compression cylinder inside the case, from the crystal to the case back, the case back, the last part of that ring lock system, the cylinder, it's actually titanium. And that's the only place you're gonna find titanium in a Rolex watch, with the possible exception of the titanium alloy inside of the Oyster Flex strap bracelet. So, in other words, don't expect to see a sapphire cased Rolex or a ceramic cased Rolex either. I will say this, Tudor uses titanium on the Palagos, which is well known and not quite as well known. Some of the parts of the Tudor Heritage Advisor are also made of grade five titanium, and here they are grade five, whereas the Palagos is grade two. Furthermore, they do have a ceramic case on the Fast Rider Black Shield chronograph. So it's not that Rolex won't do these alternative materials, it's just that the Rolex brand specifically will never touch them. Now, high horology watches. This is where I really shed a tear because I would love to see what Rolex could do if it allowed itself. That, of course, is the Tourbillon 30 degrees, or I should say double Tourbillon 30 degrees blue ceramic from 2000. 19, a Grubel 4C limited edition, the likes of which Rolex will never answer, and that's truly unfortunate. In essence, Rolex is like Lexus without the crazy LFA supercar. So, basically, Rolex is a market standard setter, that's a point of reference, but it doesn't play with super niche products. There is one exception we'll get to at the end of this. I will say Omega, on the other hand, could not be more different, as Omega has done a tourbillon, and not just a tourbillon, but the world's first central tourbillon, and a flying tourbillon at that, and all of this automatic winding back in 1994. Rolex will never do this, and by the way, if you want an alternative to spend your money, and you're looking at a 5711 type budget, pocket 20 to 30 thousand dollars and buy this thing for under 50 grand in platinum used. That is the miracle depreciation. You ask what you should buy if you've got that kind of money but you don't want to own a cliche and you want something historically relevant from a brand that can service it forever, get this thing. Now, I'll also mention Omega takes it to the next level and starting in 2007, they also did skeleton tourbillon watches. I mean, there's our skeleton watch. I should turn back the clock to 1998. We're gonna talk more about this watch. That is the 50-piece white gold Seamaster 50th anniversary skeleton. We're gonna talk about that again in a moment. That came in 98, so I got a little out of sync here. But in 2007, skeleton tourbillon watches became a thing from Omega, and now we're right back on track. So not just a flying tourbillon, not just a central tourbillon, not just sapphire discs indicating the time, but a true see-through tourbillon mechanism, and this was back in 2007 when Rolex was still making a couple of stamped oyster clasps in its lineup. So, Omega has done exhaustively hand-finished watches. Remember this watch? Remember this watch from 2018, the 18 Lean CHRO, the first chronograph? This was a hand-finished white gold watch. Um, these hand-finished watches were absolutely spectacular and a truly rare opportunity. You want to talk limited editions? Omega has made a mockery of them with the 10,000-piece James Bond series, but this made in 18 pieces and entirely handmade in the same shop that makes the Tourbillon, that was something special, and there will never be a Rolex equivalent to this. With one exception, there is one thing Rolex still does manually and artisanally, and that is haute jewelerie. It is the high jewelry watch. Gem setting, gem set dials, gem set bezels, gem paved lugs and crown guards. And if you want something like this 116759 SARU with sapphires and diamonds and rubies, sometimes it's known as the Patriot, you will have the peace of mind knowing that Rolex largely handcrafted that watch as gem setting at Rolex is still done the old fashioned way. That said, if you're holding your breath for the Rolex Tourbillon, you better be an absolute champion free diver. More on free divers later in this show. Viewer wrist shots number two, I asked you answered. Mehmet K shares his watch box sourced Schwarz Etienne on a custom DeLuca strap, looking good. I like the new shoes, by the way. Punith N sports his new Zenith El Primero 1969, also sourced from the watch box. Guys, thank you for trusting our company. I really appreciate that. Ken H of Connecticut matches colors with his Rolex GMT Master II Batman and BMW Roundel. Emil G goes for a morning dive rather than a morning drive with his Rolex Sea Dweller 4000 off South Africa. 
Christopher R. By the way, I love that submarine shot. Christopher R. and his Grand Seiko Spring Drive SBGA 413. Keep me company on the tube, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Let's see what you guys are saying in the box. We've got Geezer joining in from London. We've got John N. saying, I feel like Rolex has done so well that they could take a chance and create some special pieces. we got BNS saying that Omega is ugly. To each his own. And let's see what else. We have... Zbranek asking, anyone else get their perpetual to change over last night? Guys, on the Talking Time with Tim Masso Facebook page, we're actually doing a thread yesterday and today. Post your perpetual calendar rollover shots with either yesterday's date or today's date on that thread. That is Perpetual Calendar Central. We got Sam Leno joining in from the other side of the pond. So he's out in Europe or the UK. Really appreciate that you're joining in. And then we've got Time Hill. Thank you, Tim, for a perspective on Tudor and Rolex. I think Tudor and Rolex, they have their stations, and I think they do what they do very well. Tudor gets to be a little bit more experimental, Rolex a little bit more with the grandeur, but certainly more conservative. Then right here, John N. agrees that those Omega Tourbillon are awesome. Mark S., but why no titanium case for Rolex? Yes, I I know not to expect it, but I also think that if they can make part of the deep sea in titanium, they should make all of it in titanium. Like when we get the third generation deep sea in, you know, 2027 or 28, I really think it should be a full titanium watch. Given its size, there's no reason why it couldn't be like full grade five titanium. And it really should be, frankly, to make it more wearable, even if they don't change the dimensions. We've got all sorts of friends joining in right here. We've got da, 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 a comment that Serbia is the most welcoming place I've ever been to, and that's from Charlie Z. Well, I look forward to visiting the Balkans someday. We've got Jeff Gyro, Thailand, checking in at 5 a.m. Thank you for getting up early with us, Jeff. I really appreciate that. Ryan Michael, I love free diving. I go spear fishing all the time. And then right here, we've got Tempest A joining in from England. And Justin D, I like RD Easy Diver Chrono with the champagne dial. My question is, how does the Le Mania 2310 movement stack up finish-wise against others that use the same movement? Good. In fact, you'll note that a lot of the Vacheron Le Mania watches from the 90s and 2000s with the Le Mania 2310, they're not actually Geneva Hallmark. You ever notice that? The Roger Dubuis, very much Geneva Hallmark. And because they're observatory chronometers, you know, you're going to get just a little bit more guaranteed refinement and certification. And we've got da -da -da -da, Martin joining in. Hello, everyone. We've got Renside saying, you know, this chat box moves fast, guys. I mean, so fast, I can barely read the comments. Renside saying the Omega Central Tourbillon is a special thing, and I love it. And then we've got Amar joining in. Hope I'm not too late. Nope. I wrote a big show tonight for you and for... Our friend joining in from Finland, I'm going to try to pronounce his name, Erjo P. Was I right? Both you guys, welcome in. We've got plenty of material up ahead. Starting with the first 2021 Seamaster chronograph. It's here. Now, yesterday, I have to say, I was thinking, what am I going to talk about? And I thought, you know what? Enough Rolex. Let's talk about the counterpoint and let's make it a star of the show. The Omega Seamaster broadly was the first luxury watch I got into. The one I inherited from my grandfather, the one I received for graduation, and I am quite partial. It's hard to be neutral and an objective party here, but I'm going to do my best. This is the first 2021 Omega Seamaster chronograph iteration, and I have thoughts. Now, I follow America's Cup racing. It's something that I find incredibly exciting. It's rare that you can ever have a sailboat race where you risk a head-on collision at 70 miles an hour. That's just not easy to do. So this is almost the speed you get with motorsports, but with the drama of, you know, the forces of nature at play. So America's Cup is exciting, and Omega's latest America's Cup commemorative chronograph for the big event caught my eye as we approached the 36th America's Cup. Remember, 2020 was all about moon watches. We had the all new moon watch. We had the Snoopy before that. So it's time we saw some major Seamaster action. And with the basic watch redesigned in 2018, the chronograph arriving in 2019, it's now time to start seeing variations. This I must say, the America's Cup is one hell of a comprehensive redesign of the Diver 300 meter chrono. Consider that a standard, and here's where price comes into play, a standard full bracelet stainless steel SMP Diver 300 meter chrono lists for $7,450. This new America's Cup edition, are you ready for this? It's $10,700. 
So for your $3,250 premium, what do you get? Well, I have to say, but, and there's a big but, there are a ton of new features here that really do change the product, including Omega's first quick release strap system for the bracelet and the strap. You get both with this watch, which is a nice value. So you're getting a little bit of extra accessories. Critically, the mechanism, if we can go back to the bracelet there, is in the band and the bracelet itself, not in the lugs. So the case doesn't change, which means conventional aftermarket and custom straps can still be used. It's not like systems from Cartier, IWC, or Hublot, where you lose the ability to use aftermarket straps and you're stuck with the factory system. This is a quick release system plus, plus everything else that the strap community and manufacturers have to offer. And a chrono lock slide on the case, this is a real mechanical change right here and not a simple one. It immobilizes the chronograph pushers for security without compromising the 300 meter water resistance of the watch. What this does is freeze the chrono functions so you can't accidentally whack them while you are sailing on your 35 knot planing hydrofoil sailboat. What else do we have? Dial details, many. You still got the ceramic dial in blue ceramic, but there's some big changes on the minutes and hours register. Uh, take a look. You'll see there's a new scrolling minutes disk sunken into that register at the base of it. And then there's a regatta style countdown scale, which you can use to time the beginning of a match within a regatta. And a lovely little America's Cup old mug counterweight for the seconds hand of the chronograph, which is shaped like the America's Cup. Now. Omega seems to have learned its lesson about selling commemorative watches for potentially losing America's Cup syndicates, as it learned in the 34th America's Cup with Emirates Team New Zealand. So this America's Cup model is dedicated to the event itself and the host city of Auckland, rather than risking well, the jeopardy of taking sides and sponsoring a loser, Omega is honoring the America's Cup and taking the easy way out. After all, Regardless of who wins, New Zealand and Auckland, the city of sales, will be the winner. Well done, Omega. I like your hedging. So my opinion here, I'm sold on the price. There are a lot of changes to this product that make it materially different. There are a couple of little things we didn't mention, like the colored, rubber-coated chronograph pushers. But just for the changes to the chrono lock and the new bracelet system, I really do feel like this is a vanguard product. Not only is it worth the money they're charging, but I actually think these features will find their way into to the standard Diver 300 meter chronograph within a year or two. Where I'm not sold is on the size, and this is an ongoing problem with this generation of Diver 300 meter chrono. First, it's 44 millimeters, and while this would have been a great application for titanium, the watch is also in steel, which means it's both huge and heavy. But that's not the death blow, because I used to wear a 44 millimeter Anvox 2 chronograph from JLC. It was titanium, it was short across the wrist, it was thin enough that it felt like a 42. This is almost 18 millimeters thick, and that's where I lose my interest in this a little bit, because I can't wear that. That's basically the size of a deep sea, and while it's a viable Omega alternative to a deep sea, it has the same basic fit problems. Omega, please, at least give us a version of this watch, sans America's Cup graphics. Give us a version of this watch in titanium, please. Okay, jumping into the box right here, we've got Jeff Reynolds joining in from Connecticut. We've got Mr. Ninja Slatsman, who is a Seamaster ENTZ edition owner. That was a very cool watch, I have to say. And then right here, we've got all sorts of comments from Hans N. Over-engineering on that chrono function. Maybe, but then again, luxury is about getting more than you expect and more than you need. We've got Truman B. saying, 11,000 for Seamaster chrono, you must be joking. Especially the way it fits. That's the biggest problem right there. It would be cheap for a Royal Oak offshore. And remember, tech Technically speaking, the Omega is the more sophisticated chronograph. Right here, we have Abdul, who's definitely in our wrist chats tonight, saying that the watch is too big, too bulky, and too expensive. Omega fail here. We've got Hans H. saying, finance finding did not work, it looks. And then we've got Bob saying, true, the Seamaster chronographs look awesome, but too large and too high. What a pity. Anthony N., if I walk into the Rolex AD with five attractive consorts, I'm going to modify the language there on my arm. Will they sell me a Daytona? Probably not, unless each one of them is holding like an armful of money. 
And then right here, or if all of your escorts have previously purchased precious metal full bracelet date justs and day dates, then you should be able to buy a new steel Rolex on the spot. We've got Amar saying, Tim, speaking about Omega's overdesigned chronographs, I'm interested to hear your thoughts about the 3612 split second moons watch. Okay, that's actually a very cool watch, a very uncommon watch, a decent wearing watch in spite of its size. And it was only built for a couple of years. I want to say three or four model years that watch was available. Considering how many versions there are of it, the dial differences, it's really a cool watch and a great opportunity for someone who wants to get into a collectible Omega that's not quite a limited edition, but is in fact limited by availability. There are not a lot of them out there if you find one that's never polished with box and paper. Uh, it's a fun watch to own now, and then you know down, down the line, it could be worth more money, but don't buy it for that reason. Buy it because it's rare, it's cool, and it's emphatically not like every other Speedmaster. It's a very cool watch, and I am a big fan. We've got Tariq joining in from Long Island. I am from Long Island, man, represent. Thank you so much, Tariq. And then right here, we have a comment from Andreas. Nice bell staff jacket, Tim. Thank you, I'm trying to, I'm trying to upgrade my look from show to show. I'm adding a few new pieces. This is luxury, after all, and I need to look it. Irreverent, always, but at the same time, premium. Right here, we've got Mark S. commenting on Baltimore Spirits, by the way, who sent me a wonderful $100 bottle of whiskey, of which uh, I am enamored, and for which I am grateful. And then right here, we've got Truman B. saying, Speedmaster Racing is cheaper and slimmer and classier. And as I always like to see, if you're going to go with an older Speedmaster, like one of the racing style watches, go with one that isn't specifically the racing dial, as you remember from the late 60s, but the Schumachers, the Jordan, the Benetton, and the Ferrari in yellow, red, and, and blue. And that is just a really great way to get into a 39 millimeter watch that anyone can wear well, that came with a really cool box and paper set back in the mid 90s. I recommend collecting all three. And if you've got, you know, new Rolex money, you probably could for the price of like a Daytona, even at list, buy all three of those watches. Right here, Mr. No Day. Tim, do you think GP's partnership with Aston Martin will be the start of improved marketing and the brand getting some more recognition? Are we talking about Gerard Perigo or Aston Martin? Because Aston Martin just lost a pile of British pounds. Um, I, I think this is probably better for GP than Aston. Aston has previously created the Sublime Amvox series with JLC, which was a fully committed effort to build out an entire model line that didn't exist before. Those, watch weren't, those watches weren't variations. They were all new models. That's like the high watermark for all car branded watches ever. The tag partnership that followed in 2019 was unfortunate. It was a very hollow, superficial, and quickly forgotten, and apparently already lapsed branding effort. Now for GP, I thought last year's Laureato Infinity was probably the best Gerard Perigo, I don't know, since Luigi Macaluso was alive. It was genuinely awesome. So if the new Aston Martin watches take after that, then home run, great for Gerard Perigo. This is, after all, Gerard Perigo's 230th year in business. So I expect a big follow-up to this branding agreement with Aston Martin. I think GP, given that this kind of anniversary only comes along, well, you know, every two and a third century, uh, I think this Aston Martin watch that they launched, and I assume it's going to be a series, but the first one I expect to be a really big deal. They're on an effective design kick after last year's Onyx Dials, and I hope, against hope, that it's spectacular, because I love GP, and I love Aston Martin, and I don't want this to faceplant. Okay, now, let us talk about... Da -da -da -da. Some more Omegas, and why I think the Omega Seamaster is the most interesting watch family available, period, anywhere, from anyone. Do you want a platinum malachite diver? Hey, you can get that. In the 73 years that the Seamaster family has existed, there has been a model, and a variation, and a configuration, and a size, and a sensibility, and a purpose to fit literally every wrist, every collection, and every taste. I don't think you can take a single watch family from any other brand and say it covers the sheer range that the Seamaster does. Seamaster, over those 73 years, could almost be incorporated as its own brand. It has had so many sub-models, sub-families, and iterations, and many of them have been excellent. So, simply put, the now 73-year-old Omega water-resistant watch line offers anything you could ever want in a watch, and I'm going to go down 
a list of some of my all-time favorites. From that platinum case, Molokate Seamaster 300, simple steel divers to high horology, to a nearly indestructible Richard Mille style watch recently launched, some version of the current or historic Seamaster is definitely going to have you covered. So just consider what's been available since 1993, and this isn't exhaustive, even since 1993. These are just a few highlights, starting with the obvious one from 1995, which is James Bond and the Diver 300 meter. That was Pierce's last turn as Bond, and the only one where he drove an Aston. But in all four Brosnan Bonds, he was wearing the Diver 300 meter. Movies, computer games, and silver screen parody with Rolex, finally, the fruits of Omega's efforts, and undoubtedly many millions of Swiss franc. Possibly Jean-Claude Biver's most enduring contribution to the Omega brand was his promotion of the James Bond connection and the money that made it possible. More importantly than 007's fictional endorsement, I own one. I have one. I have had one since 2002, and I adore it. It's the longest standing watch of modern construction in my collection. I do have Grandpa's 1973 Seamaster, meaning the first luxury watch I ever owned, that inherited Grandpa watch, and the first new luxury watch I ever received that Seamaster, they are both from the Seamaster collection and they could not be more different as Grandpa's watch was a rolled gold piece that he got from Remington Electric Shaver and it was very much a dress watch. This is unarguably a sports watch. As I always like to say, the best answer is have both. Now, a watch the design that has survived a quarter of a century. That's currently in the catalog. That is recognizably the watch that came out in 1993. This never happens with the Seamaster, or at least before 1993, it never happened. From 1948 to 1957 to 1965 to 1977, 87, 97, we saw a lot of turnover. But after 93, this one design with few changes, has been continuously in the catalog. This is the only Seamaster design to last that long, giving it credible claim to be a Submariner rival. Now, granted, it doesn't have quite as much distance from its original design. Of course, the Sub was already 40 years old when this design came out. All the same, this kind of permanence suggests staying power. And while I used to think only the Moon Watch was forever in Omega's catalog, I'm starting to think that this design, because of the Bond connection, is gonna be around forever. So while forever is a long time, well, you know what, diamonds are forever, and that's rather a riff on James Bond, I'm gonna take a watch that's not diamond set and suggest it too shall be around forever. Now, don't forget guys, this is also the last Omega, that original 1990s James Bond Seamaster. It is the last time we ever remembered the reference number of an Omega watch, 2531800. And for purists, because I know you're out there and you're going to call me on this, yes, Pierce wore the 2541 quartz model in GoldenEye before he upgraded to the chronometer later on. Understood. That said, and we, we briefed this one earlier, the 1998 Seamaster Diver 300 meter skeleton was unlike anything else on the market at the time. A real 300 meter dive watch that was entirely handcrafted. With only 50 pieces made in white gold, this was a serious proposition in 1998. The dial, entirely skeletonized. The movement, both skeletonized and engraved, right down to the rotor itself. You think there's a Rolex version of this? Think again. This is the kind of thing that only Omega will do, and thank God for that. These are impossible to find. Go ahead and try to find one for sale. There we are on Chrono 24. Millions of watches bought and sold a year, not even one example available right now. So again, there are more Rolex Submariner 5510 Explorer dials in the world, at least a few hundred, than there are of those skeleton dial white gold Seamasters, and that is a very special thing. Now, in 2003, the Seamaster Apnea came out, and this was a very wistful and emotional release for Omega, because it was created in tribute to the late Freediver, um, and 
marine biology, I, I would say popularizer. That's probably his role, Jacques Mayol. Now, of course, this 41.5 millimeter dive timer was available with either a black dial, which is how I like it, or a steel-like brushed silver satin dial that's just as fetching and probably even more original. The seven circles change color in seven minutes, which is designed to aid both free divers and short dive scuba users. Of all the Seamaster models I've reviewed, this one struck me as the most emotionally poignant, sincere, and memorable. Given Omega's commitment to spending huge development dials, and well, I should say dollars on dials, for a unique model for a niche market. I can't imagine a lot of money was made with these, and they only ran for about one and a half model years. So as a true tribute to a hero, and something done for reasons that were probably less about finances and more about emotion, I really, really like this watch. And I'll say, unlike many collectible dive watches or sports watches associated with famous individuals, this one remains quite accessible to collectors. You can pick one up between $3,000 and $4,000, box, papers, and never polished, and I highly recommend that. If I ever extend my Seamaster collection, that's going to be the first one I acquire. Let's go crazy. The 2009 Omega Seamaster Plo Prof. What was once the craziest Omega dive watch, and by far the oddest looking, the Seamaster 600, becomes in 2009 the Seamaster 1200. The same odd quick-release bi-directional rotating bezel, an overbuilt crown structure, an absolute tank tough case, and unlike original from the 70s, it did have a helium escape valve. What could be crazier than that? How about the 2015 Plo Prof? Now no date, full titanium, thank God, with a matching titanium dial and ceramic bezels. You can see this is the way to get it on the full shark proof bracelet, which is also made of titanium. Now you may say, Tim, I don't have a wrist for that watch, but you do, because while it's enormous length Lengthwise, across the wrist, it's also short, top to bottom, only 48 millimeters top to bottom, which means if you can wear a Daytona on a bracelet, you can wear this. The 2017 Aquaterra World Timer. You want a limited edition? How about 87 pieces? Yes, I realize that whatever Omega has done in the past with the Aquaterra James Bond 11,007 pieces, yes, farcical, I admit, but 87 pieces here truly special and exclusive. 43 millimeters in platinum, but still wearable enough. You're gonna wanna flaunt this one because it was a platinum and grand faux enamel dial. Yes, both. The outer portion with the yellow gold indices, that is media blasted, frosted platinum. The center dial is enamel, and we're talking Patek Philippe world time style grand faux enamel. All of that with solid gold hallmarked movement components. Yes, 18 karat rose gold on the movement. And again, a very, very special piece because only 87 were made. Is there a Rolex equivalent to this? Of course not. There's not even a Breitling equivalent. Heck, there's not an Audemars Piguet equivalent. A very special watch that showcases not just why Omega is different, but why the Seamaster family has the greatest range among Omega collections. And then of course, this is where we have to end because there is no greater Seamaster at the moment, at least for sporting types, than the 2019 Aquaterra Ultralight for golfers. This is truly a Richard meal for like 10% of the price. 55 grams for the whole watch on the strap. A no-date titanium dial made of the same material as the case. And a titanium caliber. Yes, the whole movement made of titanium and manual wine so it's thin for once with a three-day power reserve and shock resistance, a retractable crown so you can't knock it off by accident, and there's a green one for me, which means the color is perfect, but there's also a red and blue version. And you can beat it to hell playing tennis or golf, which Omega actually emphasizes. $48,600 is dear for an Omega Seamaster Aquaterra, but cheap for a Richard meal. And that's exactly what this watch technically competes with. Given that that particular Richard meal is not exhaustively hand-finished, all I can say is that technical and aesthetic advantage, as well as price edge, Omega. Now, with some hunting, you might be able to find it for less. So what was 48.6 becomes about 40, maybe 39.38 with negotiation. Let's see what you guys are saying right here. 
Tim Wright, the Ploprof Tim is probably one of the few watch designs that Omega has yet to butcher. Can't wait to see how they ruin this one. Well, they've been running with it for a couple of years, so fingers crossed they don't. Uh, you have Edward Ledden saying right here, eat your heart out, Richard Mille. It's true, the Omega gives you all the tech and capability without the monster price and the baggage that comes with wearing a big white RM on your wrist. Jaybo Surf saying, ah, the Ploprof, we meet again. And we have right here, Abdul R watches. That Aquaterra World Time is a really nice watch, but 43 millimeters is a bit large for a dress watch for my taste. I don't see it so much as a dress watch. It's kind of like, it's a two-way player. It's still 150 meters water resistant. It's still a sports watch, but I could see if you had a big wrist, if you like Sequan, you know, at our company. Sequan has a big wrist. He can get away with a bigger dress watch than I can. I would probably have to wear that watch with shorts and a t-shirt. He could wear it with a suit. What else do we have right here? We have a -A -A saying Omega Brain Overload. A little bit of that, but we're gonna shift gears now. We've got Sutat saying, I've never seen any Omega Seamaster variant in the wild, but the standard vanilla one. That's why I'm lucky here at Watchbox. I see everything. And I know if we've got Wolfgang from our Facebook group in here, he's got the steel version of the World Timer. And then right here we have Brick Lane asking, Tim, what year did Rolex stop making the Submariner Comexes? I, I think all associations with Comex ended by 1997. So everything Rolex did with Comex, short of internal testing equipment used on the deep sea, but like actual products for Comex branded as such, I believe all of that ended in 1997. Um, and then right here we have some more comments. John N saying, certainly a beautiful and unique piece. And Sutat saying, that skeletonized Omega looks like some tabloid magazine back page watch ad. It's true, one of those $200 watches. The thing is, those watches are emulating real watches. And this is that real watch. What else have we got going on in here? We've got Abdul saying, I totally agree with the Zeitwerk, and let's see what Rooted said about the Zeitwerk. Ah, oh, it's too far back, I lost it right here. And then we've got Boutique One saying, greetings to all from Big Omega Freak here today in Italy. We've got Global Watch Mame saying, hey Tim, personal preference, Seamaster 300 or Marine Master 300? That's a good question. See those opinion, you ask me a knowledge question, I'm like, yeah, I got it. You ask me an opinion question, I'm like, oh, I don't know, I gotta think. I'm gonna go with Seamaster 300, if it's the platinum malachite dial, literally nothing beats that. There's also a lapis version. So between those two, I think I've got my watch. But if we're talking steel, eh, I think I still go for the Seamaster 300. It's a nice and wearable watch. And then we've got Derek M saying, I would never pay 48,000 for anything Omega. The question is, with a Richard Mille label on it, would you be more amenable to paying the price? That's the key thing, getting over the mental hurdle of buying the brand. Don't buy the brand, buy the product. All right, let's talk about what comes next. We're gonna shift gears and do some viewer wrist shots, wrist shots number three. Reese R and his Rolex GMT Master 2 Pepsi. Commute en route to work. We've got Mikhail B of Poland who just joined us in the box and he's back in the air with his Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean in titanium. Loving those wingtips out there in those fluffy clouds. Terry C. and his Rolex Oyster Perpetual 36 yellow dial. Enjoy a seafood feast of fried oysters and crab. Abdul R., who's also in our chat box tonight, is out and about in Germany and in the fatherland with his vintage Alpina on a killer custom strap. Looking good, Abdul. Aaron L. and his IWC Big Pilots watch are out for a drive with Audi Quattro all-wheel drive, a German-speaking watch and a German-speaking car, one from Schaffhausen, one from Ingolstadt. All right, send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Restoring a pioneer of the independent watch scene, Roger Dubuis. So, let's talk about Roger Dubuis. And then we'll do some live chat in the box. A controversial brand, as a matter of fact, in the modern day, Roger Dubuis. Since founding partner Carlos Diaz took full, full control in the early 2000s, the brand has become unrecognizable to its early customers. That's the Roger Dubuis of today. If you want a giant watch with round table knights made of gems pointing at the center of a gem encrusted watch made of gold, modern day Roger Dubuis is probably for you. And Richemont's 2008 buyout has accelerated the process of change. But looking back, it's clear that the first Roger Dubuis sympathy and homage watches of the 1990s were critical pioneers of independent horology and also just objectively gorgeous watches. 
They deserve to live, and they deserve to live on. Also, movements, admittedly, back then, were customer calibers, but adjusted to chronometer spec Besson-Son, French chronometer spec, and finished to Geneva Hallmark standards, so who cares that this started life as a Tavanis caliber? I don't, and you shouldn't. The quality is there, and it's self-evident. I would also say this. The late Roger Dubuis himself, at this point, was associated with the design, the watchmaking, and even the regulation of the watches, as he was the reguleur, personally named, on many of the chronometer certificates that came back from Besançon. So there is a real connection to the man himself, and that matters to collectors. The only strong independent watch brands are the ones that have a strong central figure at their heart. And Roger Dubuis, though dead, can still be that in a big way. Under the guidance of Richemont for 14 years, Roger Dubuis, the brand now, not the man, has shifted to building watches that look like this. Not everyone wants that particular look, or that one for that matter, though technically impressive. Roger Dubuis took a baby stick toward bringing back the original sympathy in 2011 with Le Monegasque. And you can see that there's a resemblance there. The problem is the collection was great, but the collection faded. It wasn't supported, it wasn't promoted, and ultimately we were left with watches that looked perhaps a little bit too fabulous for the guy who would have been into Dubuis back in the 90s. And here's the thing, Roger Dubuis, the brand, needs to consider reviving watches like this 1990s enamel dial condottiere. That is gorgeous. Can we go full screen with that, Sean? This thing is insane. Considering only a few dozen were made, they are historically relevant, still in demand, and capable of bringing lost customers back to the brand. Enamel dial, white gold, Besançon Observatory chronometer, Geneva Hallmark, all of that. Recep Recepi has nothing, at least from the dial side, on this condottiere, and you can't wear them upside down. Honestly, think about that, Richemont. Think about what that means for a moment, that you have the rights to this design in-house and you've got the technical capability to churn it out six months from now if you really put your mind to it. So I propose a modern day Roger Dubuis devote 10% of its annual production to R Roger Dubuis, call them RD original watches or heritage pieces that resume production of these 1990s watches. And at current Roger Dubuis production, that would mean somewhere between 400 and 500 watches a year and there were dozens of these 1990s and early 2000s designs and iterations. So just a few of them can be released each year. So each year is new and exciting. It will bring collectors who have never considered a modern Roger Dubuis watch back into the brand. It'll bring in collectors interested in Kerry Voudelainen, in Philippe Dufour, in F. P. Journe, in H. Moser and C, and yes, in Recep Recepi himself. You can recover this kind of interest just by bringing back designs to which you already own the rights. Second, it will bring back collectors who left the Roger Dubuis brand when that particular look came to dominate the watches. There are folks who would gladly come back home to the watchmaking capability, the finish, the standards, the exclusivity of the brand if they don't have to wear something that looks like a Lamborghini exploded on the wrist. And it will get Roger Dubuis back in touch with its independent horology roots. It's important to remember that unlike, for example, Jager Le Coult or Vacheron or IWC or Panerai. This is a brand that is part of the modern independent horology history. Back in the 1990s with Vianney Holter, with F.P. Journe, with Erwerk, with Philippe Dufour, with Franck Muller, these original independents who struck out under their own name. Roger Dubuis is part of that tradition and these days that tradition is red hot. You can reclaim what no other major group brand has, which is a true modern day high horology independent under your ownership with designs that are ready to sizzle if only Richemont product planners can cross that threshold. And finally, this decision will bring in collectors who discovered the first Roger Dubuis models just the way I did, not as buyers in the 90s, but as people who came to know them as used watches in the 2010s and 2000s. Those are the people of a new generation of watch collector who love these watches and now have the money and, if you give them the opportunity, the inclination to buy these watches, once again, new with a warranty. Roger Dubuis, please make this happen.
All right, jumping into the box right here, MCC Le Chinois. Roger Dewey back to making limited editions of 88 or 28 pieces. Yes, I think that's a good idea. That used to be the rule for the old models, and I think that if they start on that track, they could probably stretch the old models out for a good decade or so with revivals. I also think there's room for watches styled in the fashion of the originals in 36, 37, 40 millimeters, and if you design those new in, in that tradition, people will buy them. Okay, then right here we have uh, Abdul saying, Raj Dubuis heritage pieces will sell on the first day in this current market. Everything special and limited sells out. I tend to agree with you, and I think that's absolutely what they should pursue. What's the risk with the money they spend developing double and quadruple escapement watches at Roger Dubuis today? We're talking about making a dial, making a case, and decorating movements that already exist. We're not talking about a $5 million project to launch something that's never been done. This is not the Roger Dubuis Quator. And then right here we have John D. Tim predictions for the anniversary of the Explorer 2. You know, it seems like this would be the year they redesign it. If I had to make a prediction, my prediction would be that the next generation of the watch is a little bit smaller. I think you're gonna see Rolex homogenize the case sizes and target 41 millimeters. So the Sub is now 41, the Oyster Perpetual is now 41. I think the next Explorer 2 is going to be 41, and I also think the next Daytona is going to be 41. So that's my prediction. As far as, like, a, a, maybe an out there prediction, <sighs> what if Rolex did a cream dial, a tribute to, uh, you know, a transitional reference, cream dial, rail dial, just like the 1980s. How about that? How about a 16550 cream dial rail dial revival? I would like to see that, please. Rolex, make that happen. If you want to swap that out for the polar dial, that would be an excellent surrogate. Let's see what else you've got to say right here. We've got, da da da. We've got Amar saying, in my opinion, with the, with the exception of Louis Ulysse Chopard, Roger Dubuis has no match. Th that's true. Originally, they were very similar. The original LU Chopard models from the late 90s and early 2000s and Roger Dubuis in that era, they were very much in the same aesthetic tradition, beautiful and classically beautiful watches in very wearable dress watch sizes and dress watch shapes. And then right here, let's see what else you guys are saying. Um, we have Jim Murphy saying, I'd love the GMT Master II without the super case at some point. You know, it would be lovely to see Rolex bring back maybe thinner lugs, and if they can't manually bevel the lugs, can they find a way to do this mechanically so it looks the same? Rolex, please, add a little bit of warmth and touch back to these watches. A little bit of apparent humanity, even if it's achieved robotically. Bring back the bevels, and bring back a pre-super case GMT Master II. I don't see it happening, though, just because the GMT of this generation is still too new for any changes to be made. Let's see what else is being said in the box. John Griffin. Ah, modern Roger Dubuis, the first stop for lottery-winning Invicta owners and producer Michael. You got their number. Let's see what else right here. We've got Omarion saying, Hi, Tim. I read your four-part article on Quill and Pad, The Golden Age of Rolex Movements. Will we ever see these innovative movements that you mentioned in part four, e.g. the triple split Rolex Daytona? Well, I can tell you this. I did a crawl of both European and U.S. Rolex patents dating back to 1989. And if they patented this triple split system, which would split the seconds, the minutes, and the hours, if they patented it in the United States, that means they took it a step forward compared to simply protecting the idea in Europe. So if they're patenting this thing in overseas markets, that's usually a precursor to at least considering production. I don't know if we'll ever see a watch like that, because frankly, I think that's too complicated for the standard Daytona. But as I've often said in the past, I think Rolex might expand the Daytona line the way they've expanded the Explorer line and the Yachtmaster line in the past. And I think that kind of watch, a bigger, more expensive, more complicated Daytona family watch, that could be created in a triple split fashion. And who knows, we might see an expansion of the Daytona family the next time they redesign the watch, which as we all know, they haven't done comprehensively since the year 2000. Ken Leet, hey Tim, what's your prediction on the Rolex Milgauss? I predict that after this year, the Z Blue is dead, but I wouldn't sign my name to anything else. So if you want a Z Blue, now's the time. Anything else? 
What do we have going on right here? Justin D saying, I want to wear a Roger Dubuis Easy Diver Geneva Seal with a Lemania 2310 in the water. The great news, those are cheap, or at least by the standards of Geneva Hallmark Chronometer Certified Lemania Column Wheel Chronograph Calibers. By those standards, they're cheap. What else do we have going on? Uh, yeah, very sad news on HYT. This is from Nick J. Any comments on HYT declaring bankruptcy? Let's take a step back, take a deep breath, hope that this passes. There have been bankruptcies in this industry, like Romain Jerome, that have led to dissolution. There have also been bankruptcies that led to acquisitions, like BNB Concept. It was a high horology house that did top-end engineering for Hublot, and it went bankrupt back in 2010. It was bought by Hublot, it became their masterpiece, or MP division. I would prefer to hope, uh, I prefer and hope, that HYT finds a buyer. Uh, hopefully their sister company, Pressiflex, which has technologies relevant to medical devices, might be able to bring in a buyer who wouldn't ordinarily be interested in a watch property. Um, but it's definitely very sad because they've done original, cool, and utterly desirable things. And I am personally a huge fan of the brand. So these things tend to take months to resolve. With rare exceptions, these are slow moving processes, especially in Switzerland under Swiss law. So hope for the best. I personally hope that HYT comes out of this intact as the HYT brand building the watches they're building now under a more secure ownership arrangement. Okay, right here, let's see what else. We've got a comment from Scotland saying, uh, oh, we've got a friend of the show right here. Very cool. We've got James Jack, a fan of Scotland generally. And of course, we've got ba -ba -ba. CQ is in the box. CQ, the watch guy, saying good prediction on the Z Blue Milgauss. Okay, I asked you, answered. Let's take a look at some of yours. R viewer wrist shots number four. This is a long running show, but I'm having fun with it. Charlie Z of England captures a classical wrist shot with his orange intensive Omega Seamaster Planet Ocean. Lovely light. Bard H of Am Amsterdam cycles over canals to the office with his Grand Seiko GMT. Loving that shot down the barrel of the canal. Rafa S steals my heart with his Rolex Daytona and vintage Volkswagen Beetle. Woo, that might be the that might be the photo of the day. Jeff of New Jersey takes a black and white art shot with his watch box bought Rolex Explorer 2. Thank you for trusting our company. And topical and timely, Nasri O of Turkey takes us home with this knockout HYT H5 and Land Rover shot. One more reason why I sincerely love HYT and hope the brand survives. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com. Thank you so much to Sean, our in-house tech in the studio this evening. I shall see you on timmasso.com and talk in time with Tim Masso on Facebook after the show. Thanks to everyone who joined in and chatted. I always read the full chat after the fact, even if I can't always respond to every comment. Time out, Tim out, be well, and thanks for logging on.